So this interview will be video audio recorded and will form part of the Iñiguez family and veteranos, Sacramento's Mexican-American service, servicemen oral history project that will be housed here at the Center for Sacramento History. Do you agree to this recording? Yes. <laughs> Um, today is October 30th, 2023, and the time of the interview is 1.02 p.m., and we're located here at the Center for Sacramento History in Sacramento, California. Please state your full name and spell it. Uh, it's Esther Masako Inigas, and spell it, okay. Uh, E-S-T-H-E-R-M-A-S-A-K-O-Y-N-I-G-U-E-Z. Okay. Uh, please provide your date of birth, including month, date, and year. 10-16-32. Where were you born? Acampo, California. Uh, please state your marital status. Um... I'm not widowed. Widowed, <laughs> yeah. Yes. How long have you been widowed? God, I can't remember when. Not funny. I can't That's remember. okay. That's okay. Sometimes those years are hard to. Because <laughs> we had separated, you know. That's one thing oh, too. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, do you have any children? Four. Four. Um, what are their names? Um, Chamayo, Chava, Siana, and Salia. Okay. And where were you raised? In Acampo, California. Okay. Can you tell me a little bit about what that life was like in Acampo? Um, it was really an isolated place, yeah, because, you know, we lived where we, um, my parents had a vineyard and down the road uh, my grandparents did you know that's how we sort of lived uh, like working on the farm yeah um and what did you both of your parents worked on the vineyard Was not that... my mother but my father did uh yeah and how many siblings did you have uh three no we <laughs> I can't even remember. Um, my sister, three. Three, okay. Um, and what are their names? Uh, the oldest is Ruth uh, and Arthur and Richard. What was the primary language uh, that you spoke at home? Uh, English. English. Uh, did you speak another language? No, just, just Japanese, but just very little. Sure. When we were growing up in those days, they wanted to, um, Japanese Americans, they wanted you to be as American as possible. Yeah. Do you um, wish your parents had taught you that? or? No, my father, you know, his parents lived down the road, and I had uh, like four aunts. And they were uh, from my, the youngest, the youngest was about four years older than my sister, who was the oldest in my family, yeah. But everybody was trying to be Americanized at the time, yeah. So they tried to make you speak English more, you know. We went to Japanese school, but not very long, yeah. Do you remember where the Japanese school was located? Was it on a campo or? Yeah, I think it was a camp. I could barely remember because when we went, you know, it was after school or certain days. Yeah. And we didn't go for too long because they wanted us to be as Americanized as possible, you know. Mm -hmm. But they wanted us to learn Japanese also. But at, in those days, especially since my aunt, my youngest aunt was like four years older than my sister, who was only a year older than me. They wanted to be a, 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 as, as Americanized as possible, you know. Mm -hmm. They didn't want you to be like people working on the farm and, you know, low, low income uh, or whatever. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, so you mentioned going to Japanese school. Did you go to elementary school here or yes. middle school, high school? Oh, yeah, all the way to uh, high school. Yeah. Okay, and what were the names of your schools? Umbrella School was the grammar school. Then we went to Lodi High School. Wow, so Lodi High School. Yeah. Did you have to get bused there? or I can't remember if I was already... I think I had some people who would, you know, other people that went to school that would, in those days, you know, would pick you up and you'd all go together, yeah. Um, can you tell me a little bit about school, what that was like for you? Like at Lodi, were there other Japanese American children? Were there yes Mexican American? What what was the population in terms of race? Mostly white, and and there were they didn't I didn't realize it that Mexicans couldn't live in Lodi. You know I didn't know that, but there were a couple. I was you know at Campo right in the high school. I mean a grammar school. I think there were two or three people I met that were Mexicans, yeah. But in, I didn't realize that until later years that um, uh, that in high school, um, I didn't realize how I met someone here in Sacramento, and I can't remember his name was well-known, a Hispanic. He was from Stockton, and he said to go to Lodi High School, you know, they would come to play basketball against the Lodi High School um, uh, uh, students and as soon as they finished they had to get back on the bus and go back to Stockton he said I and I had no idea that if you're Mexican you couldn't even stay in, in Lodi. Lodi yeah um, that's how prejudiced they were against yeah. Mexicans at the time and did were there other Japanese American families besides yours in Ocampo that were that Lived in that area, maybe Woodbridge, or that went to Lodi High? Yeah, there were quite a few, yeah. There were a lot of Japanese Americans at the time, mm -hmm. yeah. And so who were your friends mostly in high school, do you remember? God, I could barely remember high school. Yeah, I can't remember that much, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we had to go back to uh, camp. Yeah, so tell me a little bit about that experience. How how old were you when that happened? Or do you remember, were you in middle school, high school, or? Um, I think we were in grammar school when we went. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember the, what, do you remember anything about how you were told that you were had to leave, or? No, because in those days, you know, your parents were the most, you know, they didn't tell you all these kinds of things. But, they didn't explain but, much. You no, know, but, you know, because my dad was born and raised here, he, he was very Americanized, right? So, um, but my mom was born here and raised in Japan, and she could, in my mom's family, the parents were very high-end kind of people. What they used to do from Japan was send their children to America, and learn English and then go back to Japan or whatever, you know, and that's how my mom, but for my mother, you know, she was born here and then raised in Japan and she couldn't come back because the war started. So she wasn't really Americanized, yeah, when she married my father, mm -hmm. yeah. So she was sort of really looked down on by my, my aunts, my father's family, you know. Mm -hmm. She was too Japanese, I guess, you know. Yeah. So being Americanized became like a status. Right. A status here, symbol, race, yeah. yeah. So you were in grammar school. Do you have any recollections? I know that you've been asked a lot of times over the course of your lifetime, <laughs> right, uh, about your experience while you were interned. Um do you, is there does there anything sort of stand out to you or when we were in turn? Yeah, what that was it like? Uh, no, because you know what? For me uh, and my sister, my sister was really pretty, and she, you know she was very popular. And um, when we were in camp, you know what you had to do was you went to uh, bed, and the next morning, you know the mess hall is where you ate. 
breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And every time you did all these kinds of stuff, you had to go back to the barracks. But my sister and I, I didn't, you know, I, my sister and I both, we used to, what is it? Um, sneak out. <laughs> sneak out. <laughs> and then when one of my girlfriends, she was, her name was Keiko Akasa, I think, I forgot if that was the first name, but she's from Berkeley or Oakland, California, very high end, but I didn't realize her dad, she didn't have a dad there, because he was one of those that were put in those camps, you know, the high end people, Japanese Americans, mm -hmm. I don't know if you knew where, where they were in camp, I can't even think of where they are right now, where they were put but did you know that Japanese American, that the high end people that were the men were put in a different certain, one in a real bad place, and a lot of them committed suicide oh, because I didn't they, know. yeah, because it was so secretive. I guess when I think about it now, because half the people don't know it. But her dad, you know, was there anyway. When uh, I used to play with her, but I used to sneak out and play with her, and then her father, her mom found out, you know, so she couldn't play with me anymore. But her dad was one of them in one of those camps, yeah. the high-end Japanese-American, um, you know, um, people were put in, the men were put in a certain camp, and I found out uh, later that a lot of them committed suicide yeah. because it was so secretive for one thing, I guess, but, you know, they didn't know if they'd ever come out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um. So you remember sneaking out with your sister. You remember the mess hall. Do there, do you remember being scared, or was it like exciting? Because when you're a kid, sometimes, you know, you make the best out of the worst <laughs> circumstances. You really don't know. As long as you're with your parents, right. um, you know, it makes it less scary. But did you have any feelings like that? Did you remember or? I think I did just once, maybe because I was sneaking out. But, you know, in camp, I don't know if you knew what, like, camps were like, you, every they block, you know, block 10, barricade, apartment A and B is, I think, where we lived. But we were in block 10. But the young teenagers, you know, they had a place where, in back of the mess hall and all that, there was trees, and um, they were able to play, you know, the young teenagers but I think I remember sneaking out there but there was two young men that always took care of me so that you know I wouldn't get into trouble or whatever yeah, yeah. <laughs> but my sister was always sneaking out you know I didn't know that but she was yeah found out that later um, yeah with the young boys you know teenagers and we were still so young at the time I think yeah Mm -hmm. But she was, she, I don't know what it was about her. She's very pretty, and she was very popular. And, uh, yeah, she was sneaking out, mm -hmm. yeah, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so you're, you're at this camp. Where, where is this camp located? In Roar, Arkansas. Arkansas. But it was close to McGee. You know, that was the closest town. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you could go off to McGee, but you had to... Uh, get a, um, I forgot how they did it, but you know, you had to have a card where you could get on the bus and they take you to McGee, Arkansas, and then we go shopping there or to eat, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the people in McGee, Arkansas, those people were really nice just because, you know, they had uh, people like us coming and spending our money there. Yeah. Because that's the only time we got out of camp. Yeah. So, Ocampo is very picturesque. I'm thinking of the, you know, the grapevines and, you know, it's just very green and rural. And then, so how would you describe Arkansas? Is it very different? Did you well, notice that part? Not really, because we were in camp, you know, concentration camp. There must have been 10,000 of us in there. Yeah. You know, it was, you know, all the barracks, you know, there's a, can you yeah. imagine how many, uh, how many people were there at the time? Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, we were behind barbed wire fence, but I can yeah. remember my sister and I and some 
co-worker, um, friends or something, we'd sneak out, you know, but it was very scary <laughs> to the yeah. woods, you know, because we were right by the, where the lot of trees and woods were on one side, yeah, of the camp. Yeah. But it was a huge camp. Yeah. But you should see at the time, you know, I didn't realize because I was still so young. I was eight or nine or so. Um, uh, they had built places for theaters and all that kind of stuff. And uh, there was one building with paintings and all that. And I didn't know that till years later when I got to see it on TV about, you know, the things that were there. Because we were so young, we weren't able to travel all over the camp, you know. Yeah, you had to stick to your yeah barracks, I barracks. would think. Yeah, we were where the trees were, and then there were places where I think my aunt and grandparents lived where the, there was uh, no trees and stuff, you know, it was more open. Yeah. Did you go to school in there? Do you remember? Yeah, I went to school there, yeah. And the teachers were all from the south, you know, like where we were in Arkansas, yeah. But I think the teachers were very good, you know, nice people that I can remember, yeah. Considering, you know, those days. So. Yeah. Yeah. So how long were you there? Do you remember? Do you remember when you came back to California? Um, came back just four months before the war ended, I think. But see, we came back before you know, because my dad, I don't know, I found some paperwork where how he was able to get back here from getting uh, signatures from people from Lodi, the white people, the upscale people, that said we were okay, that we could come back, and that's how we came back. So they had to yeah, they, he agree didn't. like that you weren't a threat or something. Right, or and I just found some paperwork I didn't even know, you know, I just looked at it today. But there were people that had signed it from Lodi, California, saying my dad was, you know, an okay person and all that kind of stuff, I guess, yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that he had to go through all that, you know, to come back because the war hadn't ended. Mm -hmm. We came back about four months before the war ended. And do you, how old were you then? How long, did, how long did you stay, do you remember? In camp, I think... Um, by the time I came back, I probably was about 12, maybe, 11 or 12. A long time. But I think it was eight or nine that we went. But you know, <clears throat> we came back four months before the war ended. I can still remember that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why do you remember that so much? Is there something? Well, just traveling all the, from Arkansas, you know, in the yeah. car. And I can still remember, <clears throat> you know, uh, we'd have to, we couldn't go to any kind of towns, you know. We didn't anyway. Because I, I'm sure my scene. folks were, yeah, we, had, we were in two cars. And we had two young men, Japanese Americans. Um, I don't think they were related though, but young, young men, a bo a boys and young men, they drove. Yeah, I think my father drove one and the other was a young man. The car I was in was my sister and me and this young man from Lodi, yeah. So how many people traveled back with you? Uh, my family and um, my grandfather, yeah. Plus the two young men that he hired, you know, to drive us back. And how many cars? No, I, I'm sorry, one young man, because my father drove one of them, I think, yeah. So two cars, I think. And then those t cars, one or the other, I can't remember. But it was his car that he had from, you know, when we left Lodi, I think. And I don't know how. Oh, I think, you know, his brothers, He, my father was about 45 when we were there. And he had brothers. But in those days, you know, can you imagine we're in camp? And, and if you're 18 or so, you had to go into the service, and if you didn't, you know, they put, they, they put him in prison. Mm -hmm. So my father didn't have to go because he was 45. He was already the age, you know, where he didn't have to. But he had four brothers in the service at the time. 
Wow. Yeah, one in one that was connected to Japan, I can still remember. Yeah. They used him, you know, because he could understand Japanese. So he could hear from the Japanese from Japan, you know, what the what, they were, what they were saying and all that. And I didn't know that. That's what you know, that was what he was in the service for. But my other uh, uncles, you know, they were you had to be in the service. And then if you're 18, uh, if you're Japanese American, you had to go into the service too. I can still remember. And there were two young men that didn't want to, so they picked him up and put him in prison, I think. But at 18, we're, can you imagine we're in a concentration camp where, you know, you're bob, behind barbed bob wire fence and the, the children's, you know, your sons at 18 had to go into the service, but that's Japanese Americans had to do that. Yeah. Do you know what um, what branch of the military they served? The your your uncles, your dad's brothers. I'm sure it was the army. I'm not sure, You're but not sure. but my one uncle, Uncle Sam, was his name Sam. I can't remember now, but yeah. But he, uh, you know, I didn't know that, but they kept it a secret. So, you know, I just didn't know about all that stuff about yeah. how, you know, that he was, uh, he was listening to the Japanese from Japan so he, he could understand and yeah. be able to tell the U.S. Army, you know, what was happening and all that. Yeah. yeah, it was sort of secretive, I think. But, you know, years later when I grew up and there, I was thinking, oh, that's what he was doing, you know. Mm-hmm. So you, you come back, you're 11 or 12 years old, and so that would put you middle school? Do you remember if you no. went back to grammar school? or is your... I went back to grammar school. So that yeah. would be sixth grade as 11 years old. Yeah, but I think uh, I was probably uh, in the fifth grade, because me and my sister, she was one year older. And she, you know, she would, she and I went both to a school. And I can remember one incident happened. You know, while we were gone, you know, uh, like where we were in a camp of California, Lodi, a lot of the people from the South were coming. I don't know if you knew that for jobs and whatnot, I guess. And we lived in the country. So the, the people from the South that came were really low income kind of people, you know. So you saw these young people from the South, and, and uh, you know, the people that were there before when we left were good people, you know, to us because they already knew us. But the people from the South that came were really bad. I can still remember one of my girlfriends when we got back and we were in, uh, you know, grammar school. Um, it was called Brella School in a campo. Uh, she got chased by one of the young men that came from the south. And, and in the old days, they called them Okies. <laughs> when I mentioned that, one of my kids said, don't ever say that. But in those days, you know, if you were in a campo or Lodi, they called them Okies. They were from the south. Anyway, my uh, friend, my girlfriend, Japanese American, she got chased all the way home in the grape vineyard by one of those young boys from the south. Mm-hmm. You know, they came and uh, moved into where we used to live. Yeah. Because I, I don't know if they wanted jobs or what, but that happened, you know, a lot of them came from the south. Yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, but I can still remember how mm-hmm. scary it was because they weren't nice to us at all. You know, they yeah. came and then, but, you know, she was chased in the vineyard. Can you imagine all the way to, yeah. get, to get home? So you come back and um, are you excited or were you scared? Did you think that you weren't safe or did you feel safer in the camp? Or? I don't think I even remember about feeling scared or anything because, you know, like you said, the war wasn't over yet. I think we came back about four months before the war ended. But, you know, we were so young at the time, you know, didn't even know what my dad was doing, you know, but I just found some paperwork where he had, 
he had to have uh, people from Lodi, well-known people, sign papers saying he was okay, that, you know, yeah, come back. to come back. Yeah, I think it was about four months before, but, you know, when we got back, we had to be really careful, you know, because the war hadn't ended. It was, yeah, being Japanese-American, you know, at the time, yeah. Yeah, it must have been very scary. Yeah, because I think one time somebody saw us or something, and my dad said, you know, in the car, we were in the car, they said, get down, get down, you know, so they can't see you or something like that, yeah. But, uh, um, so you graduated from Lodi High School, and um, did you experience any discrimination when you were there at Lodi High School? Because this is after the war, not really. You know, maybe I did, but I don't think so. I think the people in Lodi were not, you know. The people, the only people that were uh, more doing things to us was from the South when they came. You know, they came from the South to live in um, California. Yeah. And they were more like, lo more low-income kind of people. Yeah. Yeah, I can still remember how... They weren't they used to the... Um the diversity, they weren't used to that. No, they weren't. So they just relied on stereotypes, maybe. But it always scared me, you know, when yeah, I saw of course. Them. Yeah. yeah. But I remember years later, I saw one of the young boys, you know, that turned it, you know, we all grew up and all that. But I can remember he was okay, but, you know, um, he realized that, you know, what, what it was for us for him to do chase us or whatever, you know? Yeah. Yeah, because I remember my girl, you know, one of my Japanese American uh, classmates, she got chased and then, you know, oh, that's right, when that happened, it was reported and uh, the principal of our school was a woman and she had a, she had a gathering after school. I think, I think my parents, my father came, but he didn't go inside to talk about what had happened, you know, to the Japanese uh, girl that got chased. So it was really great, you know, like the principal stepping in, stepping in and talking yeah. about it. And I think my dad went, but he didn't even go inside. I think he stood outside. You know, I can still remember he didn't go in. But it was so great because they were still so, what is it, good to us, you know, the people that were there yeah. before we left and after we left. But the principal called, you know, to have yeah, a meeting tough. and talk about it, yeah. you know, yeah, about it. But I sort of felt sad in a way for the young people from the South. You know, they were real poor people, you know, that came yeah. during that time. And I don't think they knew any better. You know what I mean? They came and... The kids were different, you know. Yeah. The kids were different, and that's why, you know, I guess when he chased uh, my friend, you know, all the way home or something in the vineyard, I don't think he really knew what he was doing or something. You know, he wasn't used to living where we were. Yeah. So, um, so you graduate from high school, and then what do you do? I went to... Um, um, in Stockton to, uh, what is it, school? To Delta be, College? I can't, I can't remember what the name of that place was, Delta. but it was something to, you know, to be a secretary eventually, yeah. Did you get a degree? I don't remember, but all I remember is getting a job somewhere, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. And There's then the University last, of the it, Pacific in Stockton. Does that sound familiar? Ye, oh, yeah. But I, I didn't go there. It was okay. just more or less, uh, you know, to become a second, you know, it's a work in, a, uh, in an office. office. Yeah, that's how it was. Yeah. And I worked somewhere and I, yeah. But something happened. I can't remember where I had to leave that job because I think the... The, the head of the department, you know, he was doing things to women or, or the girls, yeah. Mm. And I remember leaving, yeah, at one point. So then I came and I got a job here in Sacramento at the Signal Depot. Yeah. And in those days, you know, as, as a woman, you just didn't drive. You always had men who drove, you know, that worked there. Yeah, and I worked at the Signal Depot. 
I don't know if you knew where Signo Depot was. No, I don't. It, it, by Fruit Ridge Road. It was one of the the fed build, federal buildings, but it was called the Sacramento and Signo Depot. Yeah, and I remember working there. Yeah. And, and that's how I ended up meeting my husband, because I went to a wedding of one of my co-workers. <laughs> yeah, Patty. God, I can't think of his name. But she was Hispanic and... Oh, yeah, well-known family. And that's where I met my husband, who is Hispanic. You know. So yeah. tell me, tell me about that courtship. How how did that? How old were you when you started dating him? Mm, I guess maybe um, uh, since I think I got out of school, that'd be eighteen, maybe twenty or twenty-one. I can't remember. I worked at the Signal Depot, that was, like I said, a federal <laughs> building, <laughs> and Peggy. God, I can't think of her last name now, but well, they were a well-known family in Sacramento. But it was uh, a, a relative of hers. And he was at the wedding, and then that he dated, you know, asked me out. Yeah, and that's how I met him. Yeah, but in those days, you know, Japanese marriage, you just didn't marry out of your race, you know. And so it was so, not good. So um, what did he ask you to dance, or how did that work? Or... I can't remember. I can't. I guess I was at the party or something, you know, yeah. where, she, where the wedding. Yeah. And and then I was working there, and I was, Peggy, you know, still was working there, and I forgot. Uh, you know, that's how I got to know him. Yeah, I think he was working at Mather or McClellan or somewhere, you know, at the time. Yeah. In the old days, that 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 was the two places down here. Yeah. Did you think he was handsome, or what? What did you think? God, I don't even remember. But, uh, you know, it's just coming from a little town, you know, it's it's different to be, you know, going out with someone, especially out of your race, you know. But so, in those days, you just didn't do that, you know. Yeah. So you didn't even think maybe this was somebody you'd end up marrying, probably. Not at the time, yeah. But I think he was working at McClellan or Mather Field at the time, yeah. So um, when did you get married? God, I think about what year was Cha What year was Chamayo born? 1958 it was. 58, <laughs> around 1958, yeah. So yeah. tell me about that. How, um, where did you get married? Well, you know what? Um, we were gonna. We went up to Reno to get married, and in those days, um, at the time, uh, Japanese. I don't know if it's only Japanese. Asians could not marry whites. So we went there and we couldn't get married, so we had to come back and marry at City Hall here. But, uh, yeah. In those days, I guess they had those things, huh, in towns where you couldn't, you know, marry, marry Asians or, you know, whatever. But I guess that's what it was. You couldn't marry Japanese at the time. Were you surprised that they didn't let you get married in Reno? or? Uh, yeah, because who knew? You know, I didn't know there was such a thing as that, you know, at the time. Um, so, we, yeah, we had to come back and get married at City Hall here. Yeah. So um, tell me about your husband. What was his name? Salvador Inigas. Salvador Inigas. <laughs> yeah. And um, at the time he was working at either McClellan or Mather or something, I think, yeah. at the time. Yeah. He, he was a World War II veteran? Yeah, yeah. Do you know what branch? No. I'm sure he was in the Army or something, you know. But I think he had a hard time, you know, because I think he um, was involved in killings, you know, at the time. Because he didn't say too much about it, but I had heard later, you know, that at one time, you know, there was shooting or something, and he was, I guess, lucky to be alive, yeah. You know, when he was in the service, yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. So in those days, uh, folks didn't talk about PTSD or, you know, there wasn't all of this, like, mental health no help for for veterans um you being married to a veteran who was in active duty in world war ii did you see anything that you thought maybe he was dealing with or did 
that you thought maybe was related to the war? Or did you? Not really. I don't think I remember any of that. Yeah, and it, it, it may be because I wasn't aware of such a thing as a time, you know. Yeah, and yeah, you're busy yeah. raising a family. Yeah. and But, you know, I mean, even when I met him, I had no idea about what happened with soldiers or what, you know, what happened yeah. or what they went through. But they just never talked about it, you know. He never even t- talked about, you know, being. But I later heard that, uh, you know, he was somewhere, you know, where there was all that death and shooting yeah yeah but they just never talked about it yeah so as his wife did you sympathize with that part of his life or i did but you know like he said he never talked about it. i didn't know that he had yeah but a lot of the soldiers went through that you know i think you know what i did mean did he have buddies that he associated with that maybe were veterans or maybe well, working at at the Oh, when you mean, McClellan or no, not that I know of. Yeah, yeah. I don't. Remember. He didn't hang out at bars with his friends or. No, not that much that I can remember. Yeah. Uh, and you were uh, you mentioned earlier that you separated at one point. What? How long into the marriage was that? God, um, I think we were married for. And how old were you, child? When I, about 15. 15? When you separated, you yeah. Maybe about 15, yeah. But you know, on, on those days, too, was a different era. You know, how we all lived different ways. And, you know, I can still remember um, the friends we had. Everybody was seeing everybody else, you know. And I wasn't, but eventually I got that way, too, you know. Uh, that's how it was. He was, you know, he was doing that all the time. <laughs> yeah. He, you mean he was going outside of the marriage? Yeah, but like I said, the, all the people that I knew that that was happening, the kind of people I knew at the time, you know. Yeah. And they were not low kind of people, you know. They were like doctors and teachers mm-hmm. and whatnot, you know, but they did during that era, the 60s, that's what, I don't know if you knew that that was happening all the time, you know, (laughs) yeah, yeah, that was happening all the time, everybody was seeing other people, you know, but I wasn't for a long time, but, you know, my husband was, yeah, already. Yeah, so he was unfaithful, and, um, and half the time I didn't even know about it because, you know, we were always so busy and all that. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, he opened up the art gallery and a framing shop and, you know, we had Note Park, you know. Yeah. One of the first coffee houses. Yeah. So when you realized that your husband's being unfaithful, did that change um, your perception of marriage or... I don't think so, because it seems like all my friends were doing, you know. So you yeah. thought, I, this is just what it is? <laughs> uh, yeah, during the 60s, it really was, <laughs> I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because, you know, I still see some woman friends like, was it Judy O'Brien, you know? I'm sure she was seeing her. So, but, you know, they're old-time friends, and but everybody was sort of doing that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't so know where if you did knew you knew that, if you knew that in the 60s. Well, after. I knew about, I know about the sexual revolution. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that's what was happening. And it's, I mean, it happens now. <laughs> I don't think people, you know, people, yeah. Yeah, when I look back now, that's how it was, you know. Yeah. And I wasn't, you know, still there at the time, but uh, that's how it was. Yeah. So, um you're married and um, the marriage falls apart. Um, where did you live when you were married? Uh, we lived in two or three different places. One, uh, like a 16th and D around there, which is really a Hispanic community at the time, you know. Washington neighborhood, maybe? Yeah, it was, yeah. And. Um, Alkali Flats. Alkali yeah. Flats. And I can still remember. Didn't you guys have a hard time? 
Do you remember that? I remember someone was trying to beat you up, uh, but you guys were really young at the time. Because you know what? Everybody else is Hispanic, and we were the only one that was Asian. And I can still remember going outside one time, and uh, the kids, you know, are even the grown-ups were not nice to us. I can still remember. Because, you know, in those days, you didn't ever see Asians probably living in the, yeah. that area. Yeah, so, was, Sacramento was a little segregated. It was, yeah, and, and around there on D Street, or around yeah. there, yeah. It's mostly Hispanic. I can remember all the people there were Hispanic. So then you moved out of there, and then you yeah. went where? Um, I remember one time we lived in Midtown for a while, and then we moved to where Oak Park is at the time. Yeah. And at the time that we moved there, they were mostly Hispanic, but they were not. They were good people. You know, it wasn't like when we lived on, because we were the only ones there or something. Who knows? I don't know what it was. Yeah. Do you remember having bad times? On, you don't? Okay. Yeah. yeah, I remember coming out one time and someone was chasing one of my kids. And, um, yeah. So it's different. Yeah. So I was going to just ask you, um, you know, folks who come back from internment, folks who come back from the war, sometimes um, people cope with those experiences by silencing them or not talking about it. Um, I, I'm thinking of, of you, you're growing up, you're having your kids, you're having your kids are growing up. And um, do, do you as a family, like when you go to your sisters or you, you go visit with your dad, do you talk about internment or, or does everyone just kind of, Never talked. So you never, never talk. I don't think people ever talked about it. You know. So you know. so now that there's all this interest, right? We're we're interviewing you. You've been interviewed multiple times. <laughs> um, how how do you re reconcile like that? You never talked about it, but now everybody wants to talk to you about it. <laughs> how how does that work? Because have you have you given thought to that or? No, because I don't, you know, you, you're you talking to me about it, but not many people have ever asked me or talked to me about camp, you know. Have you talked to your children about it? Not really, huh? I don't think so. Yeah. Have I talked yeah. about it? Because like I said, you know, as, as uh, young as I was at the time, um, I didn't really have a bad time. I don't know what it was between my sister and me. Like I said, you know, my one of my girlfriends, Keiko Makasa, that was her name, well-known family from Oakland or Berkeley, yeah. She wouldn't let me play with her anymore because I guess, uh, you know, we did things that she thought young girls shouldn't. Because, you know, after you had, when you were in camp, you know, you had breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And... When you did that, you had to go back to your barrack and stay there. Can you imagine those days? <clears throat> That's how it was. But my sister and I used to sneak out, and uh, Keiko's mother found out. But, you know, Keiko's husband, a uh, uh, father, rather, yeah, he was in the, one of those camps, you know, the, for uh, men, Japanese-American men who were high-end people. Yeah. Yeah, and so, you know, the mother, I guess, was really... I don't know. Alarmed. <laughs> Probably, yeah. But I didn't realize that her dad was yeah. in a camp, a concentration camp. Well, do you remember what it was like uh, in the mess hall, how you guys ate? You used to talk about you ate separately them from Grandma and Uncle Richard because of that age difference with uh, Richard? Oh, yeah, because Richard was only, um, I can't remember. Two, three. No, he wasn't even old, that old. But yeah, the mothers ate uh, with their little, if they were little, little, and yeah, Richard, my youngest brother was only like two or three, two or three, so he, she never got to eat with us or, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, they, they were in a certain area, mothers and children with little kids, yeah, in the camp, yeah. I, I did want to ask you one question about um, you were you mentioned that in those days you didn't marry outside your race you didn't date outside your race so I was I was wondering what happened when you got married 
I had to, to a Mexican <laughs> man. Did your parents accept him or would, was there any like, I'm not really sure how it works in Japanese American families. Like, do they come and ask for the hand or how did that work out? I think did, I, we just got married. <laughs> did you just that? eloped? Yeah. That, but like I said, you know, we drove to Reno. Yeah. And couldn't marry because uh, Asians or maybe, I don't know what they put, if it's Japanese or just Asians, could not marry whites yeah. at the time. So did your parents accept your husband eventually? or Yeah, eventually. They were really good about it, yeah. Are you the only one in your family who married outside of your race? Uh, yeah, I mean, he married a Caucasian. <laughs> Uh, my, my uncle, uh, a, when he was much older, he married outside a uh, Caucasian woman. Which one? Uh, who did? Richard. Oh my, yeah, my my uh, brother, my youngest brother, he married. But that was years later, you know. Yeah, yeah. But it took a while for Grandpa to accept, right? I mean, at first, you had to leave home. You you weren't accepted. You guys weren't able to go to. Oh, you to mean visit when Grandpa? I. Yeah. When you first got married? Yeah, at first, yeah, because, you know, it was hard for him. In those days, you know, Japanese Americans just didn't marry out of their race, especially in a little town like Lodi, you know. But um, but he was, you know, he was a good person, and he accepted my husband, yeah. But my youngest brother, you know, he uh, also married a Caucasian, yeah. So, um, is there anything else you want to add? I know it's uh, a lot of questions. Is there anything <laughs> that I didn't ask you that you wanted to share? Or uh, I can't even think of <laughs> what. Uh, mm. no, um, but you know, when I think when I think of uh, my family and life and all that, you know, it's sort of interesting because like my brother married uh, um, what's her name <laughs> Sydney yeah. yeah and her son is married to who, who what family is that in San Francisco you know in, in San Francisco remember in the really old old days they used to have a big old cave like where they had water and people would go there. do you remember that family Do you remember one? I'm sorry. Who that family was that that had that, remember, where people would go in the old days to the big old place where there was water? You know, it was the Sutros? Huh? Sutro Baths. So, did it's you ever Sutro. hear of Sutro Bath in San Francisco? That was one of the big, uh, oldest and biggest place where you could go to where there was water, you know, like a big old swim. It wasn't a swimming pool. I don't know. Like baths? Like it a was, it was, like a bath it was house? A, aquatic center back in the day, probably in like the 40s, maybe earlier. Yeah, earlier. It, there's just ruins of it. Now. It was one of the biggest family in Sacramento. Yeah, San Francisco. San Francisco, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and your brother married into that. Yeah. Uh, well, no, um, no she... Son. Stepsons. Her son married um, the daughter huh, of that family. The relative of, it, of that family, yeah. But they were the family. What, was it Sutro? Was that the name of it? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, big time family. But I went to the wedding, and you know, in those days I knew, didn't know anything about San Francisco, had no idea that. <laughs> You know, that was the Sutro family that was there, yeah. But anyway, if you ever look at San Francisco, you that was the biggest thing in the old days. It was, was, it, was it a bathhouse at the time or what? Yeah, that's what they called it. Yeah. yeah. But, it was, but anyway, a, a yeah. It center, had swimming pools, and it was a big swimming pool. But it's, I don't even know if you call it a swimming pool. It was like a cave. Like you know, It was a big old thing in the old days of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she married into the, um, I mean, he, uh, my sister-in-law's son married the Sutro's granddaughter. Sutro's granddaughter, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. 
And I didn't know that much about San Francisco at the time. I didn't realize Sutra was the big time family in San Francisco. Yeah. And Masako, uh, do you want to say a few things about how you and Uncle Sal uh, were engaged with the art community here in town, in Belmont? Okay. I don't. Did you ever hear about the Belmonte Studio? Mm, I don't think yeah, so. Yeah, I think it, uh, I have the, when the paper was yeah. there. Yeah. But it was one of the first coffee house art gallery. Yeah. When did it open? I can't even remember at this time. It had to be like mid 60s, I think. Yeah, in the yeah, you're right, in the 60s. Right around mid 60s. And who was the um, head of the art department in Davis? Was it Tebow? No. You, you told me the name, I think. But eventually, yeah, he's the big time. Uh, um, how about. Uh, your work and Uncle Sal's work with the Royal Chicano Air Force. That's right. When we had to move from Oak Park, we had to move to J Street because Oak Park became so bad, you know. Anyway, yeah, the Royal Chicano Air Force had their um, office, yeah. Their print shop. Yeah. That yeah. was on S Street. They did their... Uh, silk screening there for yeah. a short time. They rented some. I don't know if they rented or my dad just let, allowed them to have space there to be able to work there and have a space to work in. Do you remember what year that was? Um, I was probably. Six, 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 no, that was no, a lot later. That was in 19. The 70s, right? Or maybe 75, 76. Yeah, I was uh, I, I think I might have mentioned it when you interviewed me, but uh, Rudy Cuellar, a member in good standing of the Royal Chicano Air Force, told me a few months ago that if my Uncle Sal and Aunt Masako had not given them that space, that they probably wouldn't have produced as much work as they did because they had a, a space that they could use, but where they were nurtured and accepted. Um, so, yeah, and close to Sac State, yeah. Yeah. where many of them worked. Yeah. And then, uh, remember, uh, I think I mentioned that uh, when he passed away at his uh, remembrance, they gave him his honorary wings. <laughs> so somewhere there's a little... Oh, wow. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, so I think when... Rudy probably just had graduated from Sac State and uh, one issue, they worked for my dad. Uh, I'm, not for sh I'm not sure for how long, but I remember that's where I met Rudy Coyar, and uh, he was young, and I was, think it was in junior high school at the time. But yeah, it was, that's, that's why I first met him and been friends ever since. You know? <laughs> But I can still remember how innocent I was, you know, they're all smoking pot, right? And I happened to go there, you know, and I didn't know anything about pot. And um, <laughs> I forgot what I said, something about, you know, whatever it was, and they all laughed at me, you know. <laughs> God, like, yeah, but uh, I think they were doing pot, huh? Yeah, in there. Yeah. That was the thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think that will conclude our interview for, um, and it's 1.55 p.m. <laughs>